Hello there, I'm Dr. Nazanin Moali, licensed clinical psychologist and certified sex therapist and also host of Sexology Podcast. You're watching one of the videos, which is part of our sexual skill series. Make sure you are subscribing to our channel because every single week we'll teach you all the skills that you would need to be able to have a successful sex life. Today, we're going to talk about threesomes. As a psychologist, I often see that people make many common mistakes that you can totally avoid it if you know what to look for when they are coordinating a threesome. I invited a wonderful sex educator, Stella Harris, to join us. And we're going to talk about some common mistakes people make, what you need to talk about beforehand, what you need to do during the uh, experience, positions, how to start. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, what you need to do afterwards to avoid awkwardness and to make sure everyone had a great time. Make sure that you are watching all the way to the end. I have a gift for you at the end of the video. Hello and welcome to another episode of a Sexology Podcast. I am very excited to welcome Stella Harris in our show. Stella, welcome to our show. Hi, thanks for having me. You know, we are very excited about this topic. I got so many questions about threesomes, which is interesting because sometimes people think because of my backgrounds, my uh, audience and people think they are more conservative, but mm -hmm. people had tons of questions about it. So we're very excited to have an author who wrote about it join us today. So tell us when we're talking about threesome, what are we talking about? Well, it can mean a lot of different things. One of, I mean, one of my goals as a sex educator is to allow people to have a very broad definition of sex and sexuality. So the classic definition of a threesome is three people in bed rolling around together. And in my book and in my work, I encourage people to use threesomes as a fantasy. Maybe it is only two people, you know, plus a fantasy, plus some sex toys, Maybe it's, there's a virtual threesome. Maybe there's somebody on the phone or somebody else by video, or maybe it's just making out with three people or three people exchanging massages. Um, so I think there's a lot of different ways it, it can be defined. But usually when people are asking, they mean, they mean three bodies rolling around together in, in some way. Well, they sound lots of fun if uh, people are aligned, if they talk about these things. I'm a sex therapist and I have clients that talk to me about their very negative experiences because they were not prepared and positive experiences. So it can be amazing, but it requires some skills and information and preparation, like any other sexual act that like if you want this you need to kind of like think it through, have some skills and uh, mm -hmm. make sure you're setting yourself for success because I feel like it's such a common fantasy that people have. It's easy to think about, okay, you know, like I'm just going to wing it and it's going to be good. So, and it's possible that if you wing it, like an element of spont kind of like being spontaneous and fun and all of that can be good. But for most people, it requires some thinking ahead and some conversations. So tell us, so when people are talking about like three people in the bed, I know one of the common fantasies that people have is around the cuckolding. Can you tell us more about that? And my husband always makes fun of me. It's like, honey, you're pronouncing it wrong. I was like, no, I say how it's written. <laughs> so my apologies. I think I have a stutter or something. I practice it. I cannot pronounce it. Isn't it cuckolding? I'm not you saying Sounds holding. right to me. Thank you. <laughs> I know. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I will absolutely. I also want to speak to the um, that spontaneous idea because I hear that all the time. People want the threesome to just happen. They want it to be organic. They want it to be spontaneous. And I do think that's when people get into a lot of trouble because that means they haven't negotiated at first. They haven't planned it. There's a lot of things they didn't think through in advance. And that's often when feelings get hurt or when things go wrong. So I would definitely encourage people to, to remember that a little bit of planning is a good thing and it's part of the fun. It's like planning a vacation. Nobody says, you know, planning their vacation ruined the vacation, right? We only do that when it's about sex. In terms of cuckolding, that's um, a fairly common fetish or kink. Again, the sort of the classic style there is usually a heterosexual couple and, and the man wants to watch his, his usually wife um, with another man. And that can happen in a few ways. Sometimes he's in the room watching. Sometimes he hears about it later. Sometimes there's photos being shared. 
And, and sometimes in, in fetish and kink spaces that can have an element of humiliation, um, for, for the man who is the the husband or partner. Um, but that doesn't have to be there. Like, like with any kink, you can take and leave the elements as, as you see fit, just like cooking, you know, build the recipe the way you want it. And, and an adjacent fetish to that, you'll sometimes hear the term hot wifing, which is very similar, which is a little bit more celebratory of the woman's sexuality and doesn't necessarily come with those embarrassment or humiliation elements. It, it is worth noting that there is often some controversy within uh, the cuckolding fetish. It sometimes gets racialized. This is something that I, I talk about in, in my book and that I've written articles about. You know, there's sort of a wide swath through the fetish that where they want the third person who is sometimes referred to as a bull often specifically they're looking for a black man and they're doing that in a way that is stereotyping and, and fetishizing. So I just want to be careful that I put it out there, that that is an element of it. You know, the main theme of my book is to make sure that when we're having sex with folks and threesomes with folks, that we are not using people, that we are not objectifying people in ways that they are not signing up for, and that we're being very careful to treat people as complete individuals with with freedom and agency. I, I actually interview a colleague and a friend of mine, uh, Kevin Patterson, about that, about the racial elements of, of threesomes. So I want to put that caveat out, out there because that's sometimes the direction that cuckolding goes. I think that's such a valuable insight. And I feel like sometimes when we're not thinking through things, then we're not being intentional about mm-hmm. our actions. And I think that can create some uh, discomfort issues and ethical issues. And I was thinking about what you talked about, different variation of cuckolding, you know, because I cannot pronounce it. Sometimes I say hot wifing, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I didn't know they were different. So tell us like, how are they different? Well, my understanding is that, that they do get used interchangeably sometimes and that the differences are sort of a very subtle difference. Like I said, the when specifically being called hot wifing, it seems less likely to have the humiliation elements at the other partner and that it is more about celebrating her sexuality, perhaps more likely to be framed as something that is based on her interests and desires, whereas cuckolding is often driven by the desires of the person who wants to be cuckolded. It's his fantasy or fetish to be watching this happening. And so I think it's just a bit of a shift in who the focal point of the encounter is, who the driving force of the encounter is. But like most things in our language, I think sometimes they're used interchangeably. And like with any fetish or fantasy, I always want to use the labels or terms as the beginning of the conversation and then make sure everyone is that's going to be involved is talking about what it means to them. Because you can't count on everyone having the same understanding of words, even basic words. You know, I, I think I said at the beginning, I even want people to define sex. Uh, don't take anything for granted. I agree with you. And I can, I, I can, I had episodes on what is sex and <laughs> I can have another season about that because you're right. Definition is important. We want to make sure that everyone involved, they have the same definition and intention and language is really important. But when you talked about different variation of cuckolding, you mentioned that like, it's possible the person being in the room or next door, or like, uh, kind of like listening or looking at videos later. And one of the challenges I've seen with clients is an issue of the consent mm-hmm. of that third party, right? And like sometimes people think, okay, this is innocent that I'm sharing this with my partner, with my husband, but it's really important to kind of have the idea of if the other person is on board. So mm-hmm. I think that's a challenge that sometimes people have. Yeah, absolutely. With any of these encounters, you need the full consent of everybody. And in order for be informed consent, they need to know what they're signing up for. And that's also something often that comes up with kink or with open relationships is discussing when people are negotiating what their needs are around privacy or confidentiality. Um, Because whether it's cuckolding specifically or open relationships in general, there is often an understanding that people might tell their other partners about their encounters and asking partners to what extent are they comfortable with that? Is it just basic information so folks can make safer sex decisions? Is it a blow by blow because it turns them on? And it's definitely important that people know what is or isn't being shared, especially if there's photos or videos 
and and now that we have some of the revenge porn laws on the books, that even could potentially be you know illegal to share that without consent. Absolutely. And I didn't think about the kind of like the other part of it, right? We talk about our sexual encounters, hopefully, with our partner so they can make decisions about their sexual health. So it's very different if we're talking about, uh, yes, I'm, I had an unprotected sex like with someone versus, as you said, talking about what we exactly did, what he, they said for the intention of building arousal. So I think that is important, especially like if you video recording things. I have so much openness around doing lots of things, but videos are just like making me so scared because Mm -hmm. they are easy to leak. But so tell us about like going back on kind of like imagining like there's a couple that they want to kind of like have a threesome with another person, which is often the case for uh, many of my clients. And I'm sure that's the case for a lot of our listeners. So if they want to find a third person, what are some of the places they can find to like look for the third person? Yeah. Well, usually if a, a couple comes to me saying we're curious about having a threesome, I usually want them to do a handful of steps before they get to finding that person. I want them to really think about why they want the threesome. I want them to think about what are their fears around that? What are the potential emotional landmines? Are they ready for it individually? Is their relationship ready for it? Have they really thought that through? And there are a number of steps that I often encourage people to take first. Everything from maybe looking at porn together or going to strip clubs together, just dipping their toes in the water of, do I like watching my partner be aroused by somebody else or see somebody else naked? And just do some tests of that first so that you don't end up having you know, a jealousy meltdown once there's another person in the room, because that's not really fair to to expose a potential third to that. And that's why one of the questions I think folks should always ask when they're screening partners is asking if people have had threesomes before and what their experience was with that, which isn't to say if it's somebody's first, you shouldn't do it, but it's something to be aware of and to ask some extra questions around that, why they think they would like it, why they think they're going to enjoy it. And also why maybe that first time you want to go pretty slow it's fine. Like I said, if you just get together and flirt and, you know, make out, and then if everyone has a great time, you can get together for a second date, but you can't take things back if you do more than you were ready for. Once people are ready to meet somebody, luckily we have so many dating apps these days that it, that it makes it pretty easy. And in fact, there are some apps that are even specifically geared towards finding threesome partners. I've written a whole article about this. There are so many of them now. And part of what's great about that is you can easily screen for people who are into the same things you're into, right? You can't just approach somebody at the grocery store and assume that it's going to be a good fit for something as specific as a threesome. But on dating apps, people are able to self-identify as that being something that they're interested in. And you can start the conversation from there. It's also possible to meet people in play spaces, which Obviously, it's trickier under pandemic conditions, although some spaces are open now. You need to figure out if that's within your risk profile or not. But play party spaces, sex club spaces, that can be a a spot for meeting folks. That makes me a little nervous for beginners because it's harder to have really in-depth conversations in those spaces. They can be loud. They can be crowded. You can feel like you need to rush through it. So I think that meeting people online is really helpful because you can take your time to text before you're face to face, ask all the questions you need to ask, and then meet up in a neutral space, you know, get a coffee outdoors somewhere and see if everybody clicks first. And it also depends whether folks want a one-off threesome or if they're talking about this being a lifestyle. If people are talking about having some flavor of open relationship, Um, If they're talking about, you know, swinging, something like that, then getting into those communities and meeting people in those communities can be sort of a long-term, more sustainable way to find partners. But I do know a lot of folks just sort of want the one-off fantasy and don't want that to be their lifestyle, don't want that to be their community, which means it is a little trickier upfront to meet people, to sort of find people in the wild rather than it being folks that you're in community with. I love that, that the kind of like this process of interviewing is so important, right? Because sometimes people have this vision and excitement of this is something exciting. We want to get to it. But I heard because of kind of misalignment, 
there there has been at least with my clients some like really negative experience that time mm -hmm. so like if you wanted to make sure that you have a good experience it's important to kind of take some time talk about it with your partner as you mentioned kind of making sure you're already kind of uh, exploring the fantasy as you mentioned and then kind of lean into interviewing people so yeah. when you're interviewing people I would imagine one of the questions that people have is around SDI testing what is the etiquette around that because they have so many clients that are feeling uncomfortable kind of like bringing it up like how yeah. do you bring it up so when is a good time to ask about that and what is the etiquette around it Personally, I think it's great to be really direct about it. And I think that having the STI conversation sets the tone for all of your interactions. If you can't talk about STIs, you're not going to be able to talk about how you want to be touched and negotiate sex. And you're certainly not going to be ready to talk if there is some sort of whoops. You know, what if a condom slips? What if something happens after the fact? If you haven't set the tone for we're going to have tricky or awkward conversations then you don't already know that these are people that can have those conversations. So to me, the STI talk, it's as important for learning how people have tricky conversations as it is for the information that you get. So when to do it? Well, definitely before sex. And I say that because I've heard of people doing it during or after. Oh, no. <laughs> um, but ideally, as far away from the sex as possible. So again, if you're meeting somebody online, for the purposes of hooking up with them, I think it's great to start the conversation there because if folks have a complete mismatch around STI safety, that's a non-starter. And so there's kind of no point in meeting up. So I like to know right off the bat. And I just say, you know, hey, can we have a check-in about STI safety? And usually what I find is valuable is if you go first, it makes it safer and easier for the other person to do. So I might say, you know, I was tested in June. I was tested for X, Y, and Z. These were my results. You know, I've had two partners since then. How about you? And then the other person is likely to mirror back the information that you gave. And it's also really helpful to have in mind the answers that you want to hear before you ask the question. Because you don't want to be stuck making a judgment call when you're in front of a cute person that you want to do stuff with, right? Because then you might compromise your own boundaries. So for example, for me, I always want people to have been tested at least within the last six months. That's not the only factor, but that's one of them. And so if I ask someone and they say they were tested a year ago, then I can say, okay, well, maybe we can, you know, we could make out and do gloved hand stuff this time. And then maybe everyone can go get tested and we can do more the next time. And some people will be up for that and some people won't, and that's fine. But this is a really good time also to find out, do people respect your boundaries? Is it important to them that you feel safe and comfortable? And these are all things you want to know for sex. Because if somebody doesn't care about your boundaries, then it's going to be crummy and maybe unsafe sex anyway. So you're not really missing out on anything. I and agree it, with you. Beautiful. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm so, I'm like clapping here. <laughs> um, I, I clearly have a lot of opinions on this topic. I love um, it. Please. <laughs> I, I just wanted to circle back too, to this idea of sort of couples interviewing a third and, and the way that process is done. It, it does sometimes give couples a bad name. I'm sure you've heard the term unicorn hunter. And I have a whole section in my book about how, how to avoid those, those pitfalls, but I would also just want to be careful around that framing of an interview because it's not just the couple interviewing the third, right? It's the third interviewing the couple and making sure that there's as much in it for that person. It's not just about a couple fulfilling a fantasy. Hopefully it's three people coming together, all getting their individual needs and fantasies met. So that's one of the things, you know, that I recommend to unicorns or that if I'm the unicorn in a scenario is making sure you know, the folks that you're talking to are making space for your interests and your fantasies as well. That's amazing. You know, in one of my previous, uh, I have a program for uh, sexual health with for couples and one of previous graduates, there were couples that they were into a uh, swinging community for years. And what they shared with, with the other cohort, part of the coaching call, which is very beautiful, was that make, you're not using, they don't think about the third person that you're bringing on to augment your own uh, sexual pleasure. Like mm -hmm. treat them like a human being and treat them as part of this. Because sometimes people, when when in that situation, they think more about, okay, it's about us. 
like the couple. And that can be objectifying to the third person and might lead to some kind of like a negative experience for them. And I think uh, many of our listeners, I'm sure they're good people and I want everyone involved have a great time. So I think that's also a very, very important point. And I'm, I love that you're talking about kind of interviewing process, because sometimes when people think about threesome, what comes to their mind if they haven't been part of the community is that uh, what they watched in porn, right? Mm -hmm. That is just like, you are at the club, you are at somewhere, and it's like, it's there's a flow that like, you know, <laughs> everyone transitioned to a threesome. Mm -hmm. And how realistic is that? Right. That I think like unless the person was the person you had threesome in the past with, this is likely not going to happen. What do you what what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. And that's that's something I, I get asked about a lot and that I, I wrote about in the book is that even if three people are in a room together, having agreed that they are there to have a threesome, people really don't know how to get started. It can feel really awkward. So I often suggest icebreakers just simply saying like, you know, may I kiss you and just getting the ball rolling that way. Cause once people are doing it, they remember how sex works and it usually starts snapping into place, but no, it doesn't, you know, it's not prescripted porn. Everyone doesn't just, you know, magically on the dot, like, Oh, it's time. We're all going to fall into bed. You, you have to have conversations about all of that and make sure that everyone is there for the same reasons. And then, yeah, have those little icebreakers, you know, asking, you know, hey, it would be really hot if you both gave me a massage at once, or I would love to watch you two kiss, you know, something like that, you know, starting tame, not not immediately everyone rips all their clothes off, but just getting used to all three people being close and seeing how that feels. Absolutely. And I would imagine there are going to be some discomfort, as you said, at the beginning, but when you get into it, they're going to be, things can be natural. But I had clients that they ask about positioning. Mm -hmm. How do you position it for a successful experience for everyone? Obviously, it's very different to couples, your interests, like, you know, it's, it's like asking, um, how, how does sex work? <laughs> it can work in so many different ways. But what are some of the suggestions you have around that? Yeah, I have a whole index of positions because people are so curious about this. But for starters, you're right. Basically, anything you can do with two people, you can add a third person to. One of the easiest is often, you know, if two people are just doing whatever they want to do and the third person is sort of laying next to them, taking turns, kissing each of them, stroking their bodies, that can be a really easy one. Sometimes it can help if folks sort of agree to take turns, who's the center of attention, you know, so one person can even just lay on their back on the bed and the other two can use, you know, hands, mouths, toys, anything like that on that person. Often, you know, depending what, what genitals you have in the room at any given time, you know, a lot of times people think sex is PIV sex. And that is actually the sex that is least conducive to adding a third person. So it can be really helpful with threesomes if if you do get a more flexible definition of sex, doing a lot more with things like hands and toys, that makes it easier for three people to be included at once. Um, and there are some sort of standard threesome sex positions. If your idea of a threesome is everybody's genitals are involved at the same time, and you know this could lead to an orgasm for everybody, which I think is kind of setting yourself up for some disappointment, but I know that that's where a lot of people potentially want to go with it is finding a way to slot a third person into a standard two-person position. So if two people are, you can have basically two people having a missionary style position and then a third person behind penetrating the person that's on top. Um, and this again, can work regardless of genders and genitals. And another common one would be if they're sort of doggy style, the person who's bent over could also be performing oral sex on the third person. So something like that, if you really want everybody in the thick of it at the same time. And I think like you're right that sometimes people think about this magic of everyone orgasming together and <laughs> how likely is that our bodies are different and different days, things will be different. But I think it's sometimes when we are new to these things, it's, it's helpful to have a roadmap. And I definitely mm -hmm. encourage people to check out your book because uh, like two is good, but the more, the better. <laughs> Well, and any kind of stress or pressure is, of course, the enemy of arousal and the enemy of orgasm. And so it's very possible that that you could have, you know, high enough emotion during a threesome that that maybe a, an orgasm isn't super likely. 
So it's also really important to remember all of the other things that are fun about sex and making sure that it's playful and you're just enjoying the new person and enjoying a variety of bodies and different forms of pleasure and different forms of sensation, going into it, knowing that it's not a failure if it doesn't end up being about an orgasm. Even if things are not working, I had clients that told me like they were so excited or because of the, how new it was and different, they struggled with performance anxiety and it was tough mm-hmm. for them to, to get an uh, erection. So I think yeah. it's important to have some flexibility of how, well, how do you define success? So since there are so many people involved and there are so many ways of touching, how do we know we're finished? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, usually when everyone's too exhausted to keep going. (laughs) So yeah, it could mean everybody has an orgasm or it could mean everybody reaches some other sort of satisfaction um, or everyone's tired. This is also why I think in all sex and especially threesomes or group sex, it is helpful to be willing to chip in and touch yourself. You know, sometimes you might need to touch yourself to finish or to get to an orgasm or use toys or in your example of, you know, in the moment somebody can't get an erection or, or doesn't keep it as long as they would like, be really ready to pivot to another activity using hands, using toys, having that stuff ready to go so that it doesn't feel like a consolation prize. It's just the next activity you're going to do. Beautiful. Well, tell us about the afterwards. So like the excitement of kind of like sex is kind of like slow down. And is it, tell us about the etiquette of it. Like the third person is supposed to stay. How are we treating them? What are some of the things we recommend? Yeah, I definitely recommend discussing this in advance. It can be very awkward afterwards. You know, everyone's laying there and tired And then you don't know who, if anybody is spending the night. And this is one of the biggest pitfalls, Um, especially if there's a couple who lives together and the third doesn't live there. And then suddenly maybe you're expecting them to go home and they pull out their pajamas and toothbrush. And then it's like, oh no, do we throw them out? Because that's terrible, but we didn't want them to spend the night and you don't want people doing things they don't want to do. And you just, it's a mess. So I strongly recommend that that is part of your negotiation in advance, discussing who, if anybody is spending the night and also what your aftercare needs are. How long do you want to snuggle after this? How long do you want to hang out and talk? Do you want to check in the next day or in a couple of days, or should we all get together for coffee afterwards? Like just finding out what people want. Pre-pandemic, there was a couple that I played with on a semi-regular basis And they would come to my house and they usually brought dessert. And so that was our aftercare. You know, after sex, we'd go down to the kitchen, we'd eat whatever dessert they brought, and then they would leave. And that was a really nice way to, you know, transition from one thing to the next. And it was a really good motivation to to get out of bed because there was some sort of treat waiting for us. So again, having it be something that is fun. It's not like, oh, okay, now it's time to throw somebody out. It's like, oh, now we get this treat and everyone gets to leave feeling good about things. Beautiful. I think whenever we build a ritual, kind of like an opening and ending of an mm-hmm. activity that can feel more containing for, for many people. Uh, and you're right. And sometimes they were like wonderful people, like couples want to kind of, uh, but have their own space. And there's nothing wrong with that if you're negotiating that at the beginning. I had a couple that I was seeing and there were some issues in the past around threesome and around jealousy and discomfort of the female party. Uh, they were a heterosexual couple. And like one of the experiences they had that the third person contacted the woman, texted her, kind of like wrote something beautiful for her. And that made her feel so much more easier. And that made the whole experience more positive. So tell us, is it that we are, or is that something that people do? Kind of reach out, send messages. You talked about going to for, for a coffee or uh, it's more of like, okay, that happened and we're not going to recognize it. Well, I wouldn't necessarily uh, <laughs> act, recommend acting like it never happened, but but that is definitely something to to talk about in advance. Definitely within the existing couple, if there is one, and then as a negotiation with with the third is, is this potentially the beginning of an ongoing relationship? And if so, does that mean, you know, every two or three months we have a threesome? Does it mean, you know, this is a three-way dating relationship? Maybe we're forming a triad. Is this definitely a one-off? Obviously, you can't ever promise something will become a serious relationship, but you can be transparent in advance about 
what your intentions are. And one of the things that can give couples looking for a threesome a bad name is sometimes, and I've, I've even seen this advice, you know, written down, which is awful, but people are sometimes told they should make it sound like they want an ongoing relationship to entice the third and basically then just ghost them after, which I obviously think is incredibly unethical and a very bad idea for a variety of reasons. But I think it's helpful to say, what are the intentions? You know, if, if a couple is really wants that one off and they don't want to see the other person again, say that and make sure that's okay. Say like, we're happy to do aftercare. We're happy to check in, you know, the next day, make sure everyone's okay. Check in if anything comes up down the line, like there was, you know, an STI scare or something like that. But in general, we just kind of want this to be a one-off and make sure that's okay with the other person. There are definitely other people who also want that. It's just a matter with all of these things. It's just a matter of finding the other people who want the things that you want rather than trying to trick or coerce anybody into the things that you want because you think others don't just want that themselves. What a horrible advice <laughs> that like someone writing. It seems like saying that, oh, telling someone that you're going to marry them, have sex. And they say, oops, like that wasn't my intention. I think it's really important to be uh, honest and truthful. And I, I can yeah. talk, I'm so angry that <laughs> that what was advice for some people. But what I've seen a lot is the jealousy piece that I had mm-hmm. people that they felt, okay, we are ready about it. We thought about it, fantasized about it. But in the middle of the act, they like jealousy is an emotion. They felt overwhelmed and they couldn't do it. And I've seen all sort of it. Like they stopped the behavior, but, or they went through with it and turned to something even traumatizing at times. They felt kind of betrayed. So what should we do if in the middle of the kind of like act, we feel, okay, this is overwhelming for me. Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely never think anybody should push through sex. They don't want to be having. This is part of why I suggest that people test the waters as much as possible in advance so that they have some idea of how they're going to respond in the moment. But if somebody is feeling bad in the moment, I always think they should they should ask for a timeout. They should ask for a timeout and then think about what they need. Do they need everything to stop for the rest of the night? Do they maybe just need a break to get some water or a snack and then see how they're feeling? Maybe what they need is to shift activities. Sometimes what can really help is to ask that activities shift to to focus on you more. Maybe the person just needs more attention. You know, maybe if their partner is one of the people say like, hey, can we just kiss for a while? You know, something to make them feel centered in the experience, or maybe they ask for some positive affirmations, you know, ask the people in the room to compliment them. I know a lot of people are uncomfortable at the idea of anything that could be seen as feeling needy. But I also think it's really important that we're ready to speak up for our needs if we're going to be having sex with people. And so that can be something really great to practice just in the moment, pausing, listening to how you're feeling and thinking about what do I need? Do I just need this to be done? Which is okay. You can just need it to be done. But is there anything else that maybe you could need that could turn the situation around for you? Beautiful. I didn't think about adjustment as, as an option. I, I always think kind of a, like, okay, maybe you have to stop, but you're right. Sometimes is that pausing and kind of shaking with yourself. What do I need in this moment? And kind of sometimes adjustment can be it, which is very powerful. I love the idea of kind of starting with kind of like exploring it before uh, like escalating things. Mm-hmm. And, uh, these, these were kind of a small part of what you talk about in the book. So if people want to get to know you, I know you have a couple of books, where can they go and what are some of those uh, resources? Yeah. Well, if you just want to find my books more about me, my website is stellaharris.net. So that's pretty easy. I have the two books, uh, the one that came out this year, The Ultimate Guide to Threesomes, and my first book, Tongue Tied, Untangling Communication and Sex, Kink, and Relationships. You can get those at all your usual bookstores and, and online, but I also sell them by hand from my website. So if you want them signed by me or to get around some of those supply chain issues we're having with books right now, I do have those. And you can also find me in the usual internet places. I'm on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, On Twitter, I'm Stella Erotica. On Instagram, I'm Stella Harris Erotica. Beautiful. So uh, I invite people to definitely check out your book. And thank you for your openness. Thank you for coming on the show. And this was definitely a treat. This was such a fun conversation. Thanks for inviting me.
I hope you enjoyed our video and you got great information about how you can navigate uh, threesome. If you're a first timer or you've been uh, having threesomes for a while, put it in the comment. What are some of the advice you have for our viewers? I also have a gift for you. I created a more than 100 ways that you can spice up your sex life tonight. It's completely free. It's my gift to you. Uh, this is a list that I curated after many years of working with my clients. And I would be happy to share it with you. All you need to do is just download it. All right. I'll see you next week right here.